My name is Jonathan, and I am a watch addict. So do we start the meeting? Today we're in Los Angeles, California, hanging out with Jonathan Ward. Jonathan is the CEO, the founder, and the lead designer for Icon 4x4, one of the coolest automotive companies out there with a cult following. What we do is kind of hard to describe, but the easiest way to say it is it's classic transportation design revisited in a modern context. My wife and I decided, let's make a change. Let's care about what we're doing. We started TLC and then later Icon, following our passions and what we saw wasn't being done that just the geek in me wanted to realize. all about the story. So either it's the continuity and the design that is cleanly reflecting a designer's opinion and perspective, or it's where it's been, who's owned it, or the mystery of that. Sometimes just a watch that's completely beat to piss. There's something about it. Like it, just like the derelict cars that we build at Icon, it, it, there's something romantic about it where it makes you wonder where, where has it been, what has it seen, you know? I was in Germany this year at a car show, and there was an antique dealer there that I befriended, and he had this one in a cabinet full of stuff. There's something about the transition watches, like when we were just starting to go from pocket to wrist, and then the, the military watches like World War I, World War II, there's just something utilitarian and cool. I, I was into it already, and the guy said, oh, I'll turn it over. So then I was like, oh, so uh, August 25th, 1942, M. Muller, the, the guy had in the field like crudely carved and graved into this to note uh, his first mission, uh, which was in Africa. And then after I bought it, the guy uh, said, you know, I, I, I didn't want to bring this up because it, it may not come through, but I think I have something that I'll ship you that'll really be kind of cool. And he followed up, like two months later, I got a photo albums from the guy's original tour. So like him and I think they were in Algeria with like his friends, Night on the Town, another one like dug down in the sand, another one with like the wrecked junker plane behind him. And I just, when it comes to like story, and Providence, like, it just doesn't get any nuttier than that watch, so that's a keeper. And it's not even necessarily worth that much, the, but to me, the, the story uh, is really priceless. Jump hours are neat to me because they're just such a novel way of telling time. And after all, that's what you're looking to find out. But, but this one specifically, it's, it's a, a Your Work, which now is like a crazy expensive brand um, and they're really hard to get. And they've gotten really funky, like I dig them, but they're not as much my thing. But this is the very first Your Work that they did called the 101. Um, so white gold case, kind of this cool funky lug, um, great radius to the case, just wonderful details. But the way it, it tells the time is based on a, I think it was a 1700s clock from a church. And the idea is it keeps you connected to the movement of the planets and to Earth. So by the manner in which it tells you the time, you stay connected. So behind the scenes, there are four disks, each with three numerals. And they are rotating on their own axis as well as on the center axis as they go around. So like, it's 2.59, and now it's 3, and it's 3.30, and then 3 drops off the face of the Earth, and then boom, it's 4, and it's just nifty. I like that.
this watch used to belong to uh, Jacques Cousteau. So like 20 years ago at a local swap meet, I heard this guy and showing the watch to the dealer is like, no, I only do Rolexes and Omegas, go away. So I followed the guy down the aisle and I'm like, and we struck up a conversation and I bought it, I was super stoked. And it's kind of got some derelict funk to it. It's a mono poussant chronograph. It's a mono pusher down here for start, stop and reset. And then the nautical snail trail for mapping, killer onion crown, lovely patina. I don't think it's ever been polished, certainly not while under my care. And it's got cracks and damage all over it, and it's a no-name brand. I have no clue who made it. And I've been trying to figure out from the movement, talking to other watch geeks, and, and no one's been able to figure it out. But uh, it's just something special about it. I've always been a watch geek. I remember very specifically, my grandparents lived in like the full on Norman Rockwell, White House picket fence, and he had this incredible attic. And one day I found this really cool early Hamilton, and I brought it down to my grandfather, and he says, oh yeah, I got that, I think when we graduated high school, I think my dad gave that to me, and it stopped working. So I took it back to California, and took it to different watch people I knew, and had it just gone through, restored as new, and then brought it back and gave it to, to him for their anniversary and I still remember like certain watches that he had that kind of stuck with me that I want. To me it's it's story, it's antiques, it's font, it's textures, it's mechanical processes and like guillochets and enameling and all that just floats my boat. I think if if you don't have a deep understanding of what you're buying or who you're buying it from, I think that Crown & Caliber offers a really unique proposition in that they, they add some value. They take responsibility for what they represent. They bring it in to their facility, their watchmakers make sure everything's cool, do whatever service is needed, they shoot it properly, they stand behind it and they warranty it. And in the end, you're not paying a premium for that service, and it's ridiculous value added.